Welcome, everybody. I'm Magda Terra. I'm the Schwitter Chain Judaic Studies here at Fordham University and a co-director of the Center for Jewish Studies uh, here. And I'm uh, really delighted to welcome you to this uh, first this semester, but not the last, um, of our NYPL Fordham Lecture Series in Jewish Studies. This lecture series is part of our joint fellowship program uh, that the Center for, the Center for Jewish Studies and the New York Public Librarians, the Royal Jewish Division have um, uh, and have held for a number of years now, bringing scholars from outside the New York City metropolitan area to Fordham and the NYPL. This partnership has grown out, out of um, incredible synergy between our two institutions. Uh, we first um, uh, started this pilot program, what was then a pilot program in 2017, and brought our first fellows in 2018. Over the last several years, we've uh, hosted over, over 20 scholars, and I think this year will be almost 30 scholars uh, in Jewish studies from around the world, uh, at least four continents, uh, North America, South America, Europe, and Asia, uh, and countries as uh, far uh, away as Argentina, France, Israel, Poland, and of course the U.S. as well. Before I introduce um, our speaker, Nick Underwood, um, and uh, Shahar Pinsker, who is the respondent to his talk, I want to thank the New York Public Library and especially it's the Road Division for helping this partnership flourish, and I'm sorry uh, no one from the NYPL could uh, join us physically, although I think they're joining us online. Um, I'm really grateful uh, to the um, uh, our center's advisory council uh, uh, for, for their support. And I want to acknowledge that the fellowship program has been funded by the Pickett Family Foundation. And this year for the first time, um, we have a, a full time, a, a year long fellow that, uh, whose fellowship is supported by the Knapp Fa Family uh, Foundation. So uh, this semester you will see an exciting slate of fellows. There are at least three more uh, talks, uh, if not four more talks in this fellowship program coming, uh, coming this semester. And I also want to express my gratitude to Siobhan Verletza and uh, for her work on these events around the logistics of these events and on behalf of the center and my co-director, uh, Sarit Katan Grivet, uh, for her amazing role in co-directing the center. So now let me introduce both our spe uh, the speaker, uh, Nick Underwood and Shahar Pinsker, our respondent and one of the uh, Nick Underwood teaches history and is the uh, Berger Nielsen Chair of the Studies at the College of Idaho. He is a transnational cultural historian whose work focuses on 20th century Yiddish culture in France. His work has appeared in several journals and uh, his, uh, his first book, uh, Yiddish Paris, Staging Nation and the Community in Interwar uh, um, France, which was published by Indiana University Press in 2022, uh, was named a finalist uh, in the National Jewish uh, Book Award. He's also a co-editor with Meredith Scott of a forthcoming edited volume, um, Jewish Ideas of France, Migration, Diaspora, and Empire, which is uh, to be published by Rutledge Press. His current project, which I think is he's working on um, uh, now, uh, the library, um, is Yiddish culture, Jewish migration, and the making of post Holocaust uh, France, and his exploration of the Yiddish culture that blossomed in France after the Holocaust of the Vichy between 1944 and 1965. Uh, he's also, he also serves as a project manager for the Digital Yiddish Theater Project and a managing editor of the Journal of American Jewish History. Our respondent today and, uh, is Shahar Pinsker, and you'll hear him speak in a couple of uh, weeks. He's Professor of Judaic Studies and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Michigan, and he's the Fordham NYPL Research Fellow in uh, Jewish Studies and many 
uh, many know him because he has been leading um, the wonderful Hebrew literature reading group that has met six times this year, over this year. Uh, Shahar Pisca is the author of two award-winning books, A Literary Passport, The Making of Modernist Hebrew, Fic Hebrew Fiction in Europe, uh, which was published in 2011, and A Rich Brew, How Cafes Created Modern Jewish Culture, which came out in 2018. He's also the co-editor of Hebrew Gender and Modernity, uh, which came out in 2007, uh, women's uh, Hebrew poetry on American shores uh, from 2016, and where the sky and the sea meet: Israeli Yiddish stories that came out in uh, 2013, uh, tw 2023. Um, he's currently working on a book on Yiddish in Israeli literature, and is co-directing and the NIH supported project, the Peloton. The public sphere and modern Jewish culture. So, without further ado, Nick, the podium is yours. And um, we will take afterwards questions both from people here in the audience and those of you joining us online. So, please use the QA section of the screen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, for the really uh, generous, kind introduction. Um, thank you, Siobhan, for all the help kind of putting this together and all the logistics. Um, Magda, for the invitation and also for the really wonderful program that has uh, started with a joint program with the New York Public Library. I know that I am very much looking forward to my two weeks here at the library. Um, there are questions that I will note in this talk today that hopefully by the end of the two weeks they will be answered um, because the resources that I will have access to at the library um, are instrumental to, to this phase of this project. Um, also, Shahar, uh, thank you for doing the response. It's always great to see you and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing some of your, uh, some of your thoughts. Um, so also to give you a kind of sense, as Magda mentioned, that this is, uh, this is research that's coming out from a second book project of mine. Um, and, uh, as you'll see here, um, in my previous work, I, I was really focused uh, on the Jewish speaking left in France in the interwar years. And there were some reasons for that. When I was doing the research, there was always Oh, there's always indications that Yiddish Zionists were part of the kind of like Yiddish cultural world of interwar France, but I never was able to find sources to really kind of dig that deep into it. And now as I'm working on this second book project in the post-war years, I'm finding that there's a lot more material related to Yiddish speaking Zionists and kind of their contributions to what I call uh, Yiddish Paris and Yiddish France more broadly. So this is, uh, will ultimately become one of the chapters in this new book uh, that is specifically about the contributions to kind of Yiddish Jewish cultural life in France that the Zionists uh, were contributing to. to. Just kind of give a context of kind of where this specific kind of um, talk is coming from. After four years of Nazi occupation, collaboration, and accommodation, Paris was liberated on August 25th, 1944. And though Paris had not been bombed directly during the war, it was still in ruins, socially, politically, and culturally. It was a hotbed for political revolution. There were food shortages, inflation, and a dire housing crisis. It was a, um, uh, which affected Jew, uh, Jews in France greatly, excuse me. In fact, there were meetings scheduled as early as October, 1944 to address that housing shortage within, Yiddish, within the Yiddish speaking Jewish population in France. And that, year, that month, October, 1944, as you'll hear, in a moment is a, is a very important uh, month for, for our story here. And these meetings were not intended for an insignificant population either. Importantly, the post-war Jewish population over the course of, of several years would grow to around 250,000, which was similar to the number of, the, of France's interwar Jewish population, although the makeup is different. We can probably talk about that in the Q&A if you'd like. In post-war France, Yiddish-speaking Jews almost immediately tried to revive the vibrant Yiddish cultural world that made up interwar Yiddish Paris. Also in that October 1944, um, the communist Yiddish daily newspaper, the Naya Pressa, which dated to 1934 and had been published clandestinely during the war, began publishing openly again. 
also in that October, the Arbeta Rings Library, so the Bundes in Paris, which was also founded during the interwar years, reopened. The, the, the Bundist Yiddish language newspaper, Unser Stimme, called it, quote, a joyous news for lovers of Yiddish books. In follow-up reports, the newspaper would let its readers know that the contents of the library had evaded confiscation by the Gestapo during the war. There was a call for uh, and reporting on acts of unity that permeated much of what was published in the press too. For example, I, uh, A. Higer wrote in uh, the Bundes in Unzerstimmer that, quote, immediately after Hitler came to power, the Nazi regime set a goal to annihilate the Jewish people and paid particular attention to annihilating interconnected Yiddish cultural worlds. Therefore, the construction of Jewish cultural life must, in the first place, be brought together in order to ensure that Yiddish writers who were saved from Hitler's henchmen have fruitful daily lives. Jewish libraries, book publishers must be reestablished. Jewish culture ought to develop and enable young Jews to indulge their national culture, end quote. It was the redevelopment of cultural life that some Yiddish cultural activists saw as the most important aspect of reconstructing their community, community excuse me, in Europe after Hitler. And it was, bef uh, and it was before the war, uh, and as it was before the war, excuse me, it was to be done in Yiddish cultural and national terms. Yiddish theater and Yiddish choruses too started to make their return as early as December 1944. And from this foundation, Yiddish culture in France would build again quickly. There were also an attempts to ensure Yiddish cultural continuity and educate the next generation by way of publications aimed at children, such as the Yiddish language instructional book, Ich Learn Yiddish, Learn and Learn Book, or I Learn Yiddish, uh, Learning and, and, and Reading Book, which was published in 1947. For, uh, and the journal for Unsere Kinder, Journal for Jungten Kinder, for, for our children, uh, journal for uh, uh, young people and children, uh, which ran from 1950 to 1955. Quote, whatever the reasons, right, it's up, uh, writes Itzhak Niborski, the fact is that between the liberation and the end of the 1960s, the immigrant, Jew the immigrant Jews of Eastern Europe Numerous both in Paris and in the provinces, enriched by considerable experience in matters social and political, produced a many-sided and fruitful Yiddish culture. During the post-war years, Yiddish culture specifically was by no means the only mode of Jewish social and intellectual redevelopment. Importantly, groups such as the Union for the um, for, uh, uh, Union for the uh, the Resistance of Jews and Mutual Aid which began as a resistance organization in April 1943, emerged as a central component <clears> of <throat> post-war Jewish, French Jewish life, um, turning the building in the 10th arrondissement at 14 Rue de Paradis into a quasi-community quasi center. It was also during these years that the Center for Jewish, uh, for Contemporary Jewish Documentation, or the CDJC, took shape, and that would also ultimately be the foundation for what uh, ultimately become the Mo Memorial de la Shoah, um, which is Paris's uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum. Also very active during these years were the Bund's um, uh, uh, Socialistische Kinderfarband or Socialist Children's uh, Union SCIF, which helped to complement some of the work also being done with children by the Arbeta Ring. There was also the important Neuf Guy Rue Guy Patin, which was a, uh, a, a, a salon of intellectual Jews, uh, and the support of the Jewish Labor Committee was giving support to post-war uh, cultural life. These groups helped to form a base from which a series of groups and organizations could balance the experiences of Yiddish-speaking Jews who returned to Paris, either from hiding or from Nazi concentration and death camps, and who had lived in Paris before the war, and those who were actively involved in the French resistance, and Yiddish-speaking Jews who made their way to Paris in the wake of their wartime experiences in Central and Eastern Europe. In addition to these staunchly leftist and typical for Yiddish Paris uh, outlets, Zionists too restarted their initiatives and began new ones during this tumultuous immediate post-war period. And this is gonna be the focus for the rest of the talk today. And I'd like to highlight the French Zionist culture that was produced in Yiddish in France during these post-war years. Through an exploration of the journals, organizations, and 
of the events produced by these Yiddish and French-speaking Parisian Zionists, we will learn how and why Yiddish remained relevant for Zionists. And perhaps in the Q&A, we can even talk about that shift, right? So uh, uh, we'll, we'll get into this later. One of the few examples of post-war Zionist culture in France was the Zionistische Stimme, or the Zionist voice a new bulletin that was published under the auspices of the, organization, the Zionist Organization of France and published monthly beginning in April 1945. It chronicled this period and highlighted developments in Europe, France, and mandatory Palestine, <laughs> and also agitated for Jewish movement to the land of Israel. Under an October 1945 political cartoon, for example, the caption read, are more than six million Jewish sacrifices needed before the gates of Israel are opened? They also advocated for a boycott of Germany in December of 1945, sponsored national Zionist con con congresses in France, which also serve as the memorial to the, in their, uh, in their words, um, six million saints. One particular event organized by the uh, Zionist Organization of France and advertised in the Zionist uh, voice featured a performance by Leon Algazi's chorus. Algazi was a longstanding uh, Yiddish and Hebrew choral director who ran choruses beginning in the early 1930s uh, and continued his work after liberation in late 1944 and then continued directing choruses through the 1950s. And they also had speeches by uh, Professor Selig uh, Brodetsky, Itzik Greenboim, and Beryl Lokar, as well as the British Member of Parliament, uh, Barnett uh, Janner, who was also president of the Zionist Feder Federation of Great Britain. And the final issue that I have had access to is from March 1947. And I'm hoping that I will be able to amend some of that language because after this next two weeks, I should have uh, more uh, access to more issues post March 1947. But that last one I've had the chance to look at was published as a special issue in French and Yiddish in celebration of the seventh National Congress of the Zionist Organization in France. Certainly Yiddish culture was not new to France in the post-war years. It had a presence in France in the fin de siècle. By the end of war years, the presence gained prominence and was more fully institutionalized with the opening of seven, several Yiddish cultural organizations, a dynamic and international Yiddish theatrical scene presence of several Yiddish choruses, as well as a robust number of Yiddish periodicals, including daily and weekly newspapers. During the post-war years, a key feature of the rebuilding of Yiddish culture in France was the arrival of a set of new journals and publishing houses, namely the, the journals uh, Paris Schriften that ran from 1945 to 1946, which tended leftist, Oifs or Renewal from 1947 to 1948, which also tended leftist, and then the Zionist Kiyum, which means kind of existence or survival. And those two, um, that those two ways of understanding Kiyum is actually really kind of played around with, with many of the writers in Kiyum. <laughs> there was also a publishing house, uh, Farlag Oifsne, which published at least 70 books by the time it closed in 1975. The journal Paris Zeitschrift um, ran from 1953 to 1969 and also published books under its auspices. Uh, Pat is a Schriften and Oifsne, like I mentioned, both the journal and the publisher were linked to Jewish leftists or communists in France. And notably, too, unlike some corners of the global Yiddish, uh, global Jewish and Yiddish worlds, but similar <coughs> places like Canada and Argentina and even Israel is the work as Yael Heber and uh, Rachel Rozhansky and Shachar Pinsker uh, are kind of showing us now, too. So even though this is sim somewhat unique that the kind of the, the, the Zionist kind of um, uh, continued use of uh, Yiddish, um, there are spaces around the world that, uh, that are similar to them. And this tradition of producing Zionist culture in Yiddish did not wane in the post-war years. One example of that for us today is that journal Kiyum, which was affiliated with the Zionist Federation of Jewish, of the, of Jewish Societies uh, of France, which is just typically shortened as Federation, and which between 1948 and 1950, uh, 1954 published 65 issues. During the interwar years in France, it was the left, the communists, Bundists, and the Linke Population, who were the most active in the production of secular Yiddish culture by way of their institutions, namely the Kulturliga, the Menem Farband, and the Arbeiterheim, respectively. So communist, Bundist, uh, left, uh, um, labor Zionist. The dynamic uh, continued into the post-Holocaust 
uh, years too. And in some cases, the institutions changed or disappeared. For example, the Communist Kulturliga <coughs> no longer existed in France, but the Bundes made them far banned and the labor Zionist Arbeiterheim did. Added to this was the development of a more centrist Zionist Yiddish culture by way of the Federation. During the interwar years, there was a Zionist Yiddish language daily newspaper, the Paritza Heint, but it did not spawn production in the way that the Federation did after the war. The Federation, in addition to Kiyum, would also open a popular university, a Folk University, and a language circle, among other initiatives. Kiyum was also affiliated with a publishing house of the same name and released, and released at least six books between 1951 and 1967. There were other Zionist Yiddish language outlets in France too. For example, there were the newspaper Arbetervort or the Workers' Voice, which was published from 1946 to 1974, and Unservort, which ran from 1947 through 1958. All on my agenda for the next two weeks of the public library. <laughs> there was also a French language uh, paper, La Voix, which seemingly had only short run from 1956 to 1957 and was published by the Confederation of General Zionists of Europe and North Africa. And I should also add to this list um, that there was a, um, uh, an organization um, called the Center, uh, the, uh, the, the, the People's Center, uh, Jewish People's Center in France that was raising significant amounts of money by the JDC, um, kind of and interjecting some of that money in the late 1940s by way of a uh, Zionist uh, uh, figure named Mark Garblum, uh, who was getting millions of francs uh, from the JDC to help kind of support some of his initiatives as well. These Zionist programs were published and took place in Yiddish, which seemingly shifts narratives about the marginalization of Yiddish within Zionist circles after the Holocaust, and certainly after the declaration of the State of Israel. I would like to now turn to the journal Kiyum and some of the poetry published within its pages, as well as briefly the Federation's Folks University. On its opening pages, Kiyum set the tone for its literary and journalistic approach. In What Do We Do, um, K. Kelman Fagenboim states that, that they were going to, quote, build an independent tribute for survivors in Europe. And that with this journal, we will confirm the lyrics of the partisan hymn, Mir Zenindo, we are here, end quote. <laughs> it was with this impulse of rebuilding that Kiyum entered the post-war Parisian journalistic space. But there was a sense <laughs> of ambivalence, there was a sense of ambivalence, excuse me, for example, when in his inaugural piece, the noted French Zionist Israel de Freuken asks, Kiyum, Sulibvos, survival for what reason? For de Freuken, it was a search, quote, for the survival of the Jewish nation and how to ensure this existence, end quote. Coupled with this, in that first issue, Kiyum also published an article by Marc uh, Jorvecki um, titled, And Perhaps a Miracle Will Happen. It was in that piece that according to historian Mark L. Smith, um, George, uh, uh, George, uh, George Jackie, uh further articulated his thoughts on quote, quote, resistance, which he claimed was a resignation from life going certainly and openly to face death, end quote. Resistance would be an ongoing theme for the journal, which would, which have, which would have resonated um, for readers in France. Indeed, in April 1949, Kiyum dedicated an, the entire issue to the sixth anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. This was followed by an issue de dedicated to the one year anniversary of the founding of the State of Israel. In these years after the war, there was seemingly <clears throat> unease about directly addressing the personal Holocaust experience of the Jews in Europe and around the world who had survived. The periodical was certainly dedicated to maintaining Jewish life and existence, and because of its Zionist tendencies, it did not always speak specifically to its French context. When the journal did cover French themes in general, it seemed to focus on what was lacking within the French Jewish cultural sphere. In its pages, Kiyum published poetry, and some of that poetry demonstrates how within its more artistic and literary content, France did feature as a point of focus. In 1948, the, po uh, the poet um, Rezel Zielinski arrived in Paris after spending the war years in the Soviet Union. She would spend 1948 to 1950 and part of 1951 in Paris before emigrating to the United States. 
Born in Gabin, a tree-laden small town in the Russian Empire, Zelensky was 18 when in 1928, the Warsaw Yiddish Daily Volkszeitung uh, published her first poem. While in Paris, she published five poems in Kiyum. And it ought to be noted that Shalinsky was not a staunch adherent of any political movement. One of the reasons that some scholars of her actually think that um, caused her relative obscurity. And this apolitical approach by Zelensky, which, have read, which would have resonated with some corners of Yiddish Paris, may have fed into the universalizing themes that typified her poetry. In her 1949 poem, Duves Gornish, as du host you know nothing as you've written, echoes this sentiment. sentiment. While she was in Paris in May 1949, Zelensky writes, you cry an ancient cry of a hungry wolf in deep snow. You live in the night. Your father's ancient fear on your last path. No, you know nothing as you have written. The imagery referencing animals, in particular a predator, the act of crying, the night, last paths taken, and parents speaks to an Eastern European Jewish experience of the Holocaust that may have resonated with some of the readers. These themes related to survival and the strugglings of grappling with one's own existence in the wake of genocide would have been amplified given the outlet, a new addition to the Yiddish cultural landscape of Paris, Kiyum, which, as I mentioned before, translates as existence but can also be meant, uh, can also mean survival. In 1950, she published three poems, two were untitled and one was titled the Mona Lisa. Place was an important element in Jelinski's poetry too. And this aspect of her writing was present in that October 1950 poem about the most famous painting in the world, which happens to be a portrait of a woman that hangs in the halls of the Louvre Museum. As Sarah Horowitz shows too, place and in particular Paris was an important aspect of many post-war French literary outputs. Jelinski's fourth stanza, Mona Lisa, mirrors the cycle of the day through an imagined engagement with Mona Lisa as the person depicted in the portrait smiles, winks, and cries. I am just like her, writes Jelinski in the last stanza, in a restless sleep, and it is getting cold, my body is freezing. End quote. This is a poem about Mona Lisa, the Da Vinci painting that would have already been returned to its home in the Louvre Museum. It went back up on display a couple months earlier. Here, Zelinsky is connecting to the city of light by way of one of its most famous residents. But her description of her moment as quote unquote restless and freezing paints a picture of discomfort. Indeed, as Rachel Ertel has written, Zelinsky's poetry has a destabilizing quality. Similarly, in the first two published poems together under the title Tzvei Leader, or two poems, Zelinsky writes with a sense of longing, bidding farewell to the forests and stones and wonder, quote, and maybe you wake up on a tree, end quote. Here, Zelinsky seems to be grappling with the loss of her, home, the loss of her hometown, Gabin. So the imagery of the forest and the stones speak to this longing for the past as well as to commemoration. Indeed, as a uh, scholar of Zelensky's um, uh, has, has, has written, uh, Gr uh, Grosinger argues, reading Holocaust poetry is thus like reading from the ashes. Survivors like Zelensky attempted to live a life after survival, more dead than alive themselves, identifying with the murdered victims. This is especially true considering the urban landscape within which she found herself in 1950. These two poems were written in Fontainebleau, which is just outside of Paris in autumn of 1950. So these poems are published in almost real time, given these words an even greater feeling of relevance and urgency. But why publish these poems in a Zionist periodical? There is seemingly no Zionist content here. One political, we can debate that too. One political under, uh, potential understanding is that Zelensky, Zelensky simply needed an outlet for her work. And given that what we know about her pop politics, this is possible. Meaning she chose to publish with Kiyum because they were simply there. But what was in it for Kiyum? There are no editorial archives for any of the periodicals I'm working with. I, I, I think I say that every single time I'm working with a newspaper. There are no <laughs> administrative archives. Um, so, I, so some of this is speculation. But I suspect that Kiyum, because as I mentioned before, bemoaned the lack of Jewish content in France, was interested in being an arbiter of Yiddish cultural content. And so what that content was, whether or not that 
content was a poem about a famous painting that is highly associated with France, um, it seemed that Kiyum would be interested, and especially because Kiyum was published by the Culture Center by the Federation of Jewish Communities in France. So it was part of its mission to produce culture for the community in France. And these poems were clear ways for the journal to embrace that element of its mission. I also think that these poems tap into the way Jews in post-war France would have been feeling and in the way that these poems are also speaking to the people and helping to reimagine what community might look like in France after the Holocaust. Alongside Kiyum, the Federation for the uh, uh, Federation of the Jewish Societies of France also ran a People's University of Folk Society. <laughs> and although, again, records are scant, we can reconstruct what the university was doing by way of ads and flyers for its events and courses. A regular aspect of their programming was public lectures, and the scope was wide. On a Thursday morning in late April in the mid 1960s, for example, Josef Gottverschein who was a longtime resident of Yiddish Paris, dating to 1926, was involved in the Federation and was a lecturer for the university, who gave a talk on the assassination of Herschel Greenspan. Greenspan was, of course, the Jewish ref refugee living in Paris who, in November 1939, walked into the German embassy and assassinated the Nazi diplomat Ernst von Rapp. It was this assassination that the Nazis used as ju a justification for Kristallnacht just days later. And in 1964, there was a program that was meant as a memorial um, uh, of Israel Yefroikin's uh, 10 years. As a part of the program, which was titled The Soul of a Generation, Goldfarstein <laughs> gave another talk entitled Israel Yefroikin, Spiritual Legacy at the crossword, Crossroads of Jewish Fate. The event was organized by El Kurland, who was the editor uh, of the successor junior, journal to Kiyum, Unzer Kiyum, and according to local coverage, the event was to paint a picture of Efroiken as a community builder. The following month in November, the university <coughs> was El uh, Kuferstein, who was then the chairperson for curriculum at the High, high Workers School of the um, Histarut in uh, Tel Aviv. The talk was titled From Generation to Generation in Israel. The programming that October and November spanned issues related to the history of Nazi Germany, and by way of that event, a focus on both Jewish resistance and pre-war violence against Jews. Programming also spoke very clearly to the themes related to the community building aspects of some of the Yiddish elites in Parisian Jewish communal life, as well as in Jewish life in the land of Israel. Taken together, these events spoke to continuity and rupture and seemingly implored these, those in attendance to take seriously their relationships to the Jewish community, as well as Jewish history and culture. And these programs too were led by and centered on local figures. This highlighting or hosting local speakers was not the only way programming was built, however. For example, on November 5th, 1964, the university hosted um, the, which, according to the press, well-known historian and scholar, uh, Professor A.M. Chloe, who was scheduled to deliver, to deliver a talk <laughs> on Judaism in the Council from Vatican II. The press said, and I'm actually still trying to figure out exactly which newspaper this is, I think it was in Unzerfort, uh, again, should have this figured out by the end of the next two weeks, uh, because Unzerfort is at the uh, NYPL. Um, but in the press, it said that questions related to uh, related between Christian and Jewish world deserves the greatest attention of the Jewish community in Paris. There was an ad too that ran to promote this event, which was to be held at the university, which is um, which was in Paris, and highlight, highlighted that this was the second of, uh, event that Professor Floy held at the university on the same topic. This was. Uh, this was one on November 19th, so, and so he was in high demand, and the subject was of interest. <coughs> Alongside this ad, too, was a small blurb highlighting a new initiative from the Federation, a library, which was to hold books in Yiddish, French, Hebrew, and include a section of rabbinic literature. It was open every day from 3 to 7 p.m., and on Tuesdays from 6.30 to 9 p.m. The Zionist Quarter of Yidd Yiddish Paris was an active one outpacing what we know of their activities during the interwar years. And their focus, was broad, their focus was broad and looked at not only what might be expected, develops uh, in mandatory Palestine and then the state of Israel, 
but also on issues related to France and how Yiddish culture broadly conceived, and I'm thinking of the Zielinski poems here, connects with France. These Zionist cultural productions in Yiddish also focus on what was happening related to uh, Jewish and Christian relations and developments in other parts of Europe. It should be noted too that these initiatives did not advocate for Jews in France to move to Israel, although there were some calls for emigration in those early issues of the Zionistische Stimme. This was not an ongoing or regular kind of call uh, to action by the Yiddish speaking Zionists uh, in, in Paris. There were regularly ads for travel agents that could help one visit Palestine slash Israel, depending on when the ad ran. But there was not regular encouragement for Jews to leave France. Support Israel? Yes. Move there? Not so much. I would like to suggest that what we might be seeing here, and I would like to explore this more, is that perhaps these post-war Zionist Yiddish culture makers and activists were trying to recuperate a Zionist diaspora nationalism as articulated by French from the siècle and 20th century Zionists, such as Bernard Lazare and Edwin Flegg, two uh, French, uh, um, French uh, uh, thinkers. But they were doing this by borrowing from their leftist colleagues in that they maintain these y initiatives in Yiddish, therefore giving this particular post-war French Zionism a peculiar inflection that was seemingly focused on not just the state of Israel, but also in France and maintaining certain notions of French belonging, as well as Eastern European and the Jewish culture that had been produced there, which was based in Yiddish, and that had just been most recently almost completely destroyed by the Nazis and the Holocaust. <clears throat> I would like to suggest another reason for which Zionists in France maintained Yiddish as the lingua franca of their cultural endeavors. These Zionists saw themselves very much as European and Yiddish to them was a European language as was French. Hebrew was not seen in this regard. Also quite simply, Yiddish was the language that the majority of this interested community spoke as well as French. So the two languages they were operating in were French and Yiddish. Um, not, uh, not Hebrew. So on another level, like the question of the apolitical Zielinski, why was she published in a Zionist publication? To some extent, it was a matter of practicality. Within leftist circles, Bundes, communists, etc., utilizing Yiddish was part of their ideological framework. But these Zionists took a different approach, which is that they needed to meet people where they were. And it, was, and it is seemingly for that reason that Zionists uh, in post-war France utilized Yiddish, just as they did from time to time use French. These Zionists in France uh, were trying to rebuild a community. And as we've seen here today, they were trying to do it in a way that would resonate with the largest number of people. Had they switched to Hebrew, they may not have been successful for Jews in post-war France had very, very, um, uh, very basic, if any, linguistic capabilities in modern Hebrew. It was community in the attempt to reconstruct a Jewish world in France after the Holocaust that drove these Zionists as much as it was support for the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine before 1948 or support for the state after 1948. French Zionist Yiddishism was an attempt to advocate for global Jewish belonging, almost to borrow a Bundes turn of phrase, wherever Jews found themselves. And in post-war Europe, for these Zionists, that meant either in France or perhaps the state of Israel. Through their prolific production of Yiddish culture, Zionists <coughs> claim Yiddish as a potential Zionist language, like it had been in France before the war. That would be a cornerstone for their local community building project that was coupled with efforts to support the development of the state of Israel. Thank you very much, Shachar. I'm looking forward to the response and also to hear afterwards. Thank you, Shachar. The camera, so. <laughs> All right, camera. So maybe look after that. You can sit here and then. You... I have to switch the camera. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, that's fine. We can, I can move the camera. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Thank you to Magda uh, for the introduction and for uh, invited, inviting me uh, uh, to do it. And I have to say thank you to the New York Public Library and all of them because, as Nick is about to find in the next couple of weeks in my own work also, I mean, just the incredible uh, wealth of materials that we have, newspapers and journals and books and things that I am still not sure to this day why materials from Paris and from Palestine and from all over the world found its home at the New York Public Library, but we are very lucky uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be here this year and to be able to tap into these materials. 
Uh, but thank you, most of all, to Nick for letting me get a glimpse of the paper, a very rich paper just before you had uh, uh, this lecture. And, you know, I mean, obviously this, this, uh, this talk is, is very tentative, right? Because this is the beginning of a project and you are about to find materials, but we already have here um, very rich materials. And I think that the most, important, uh, the most important element is that although it seems like it's talking about a very kind of specific, and maybe some people will say relatively small phenomenon of Yiddish in Paris, in France, after World War II, it actually touches on so many issues that are so central uh, 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 to us, right? Um, you know, obviously it's, it's about questions of, of uh, Jewish life in, in France and in Paris specifically, but it's also about post-World War II Jewish culture and Yiddish culture. I think it's also um, has a way, and this is obviously my own work on Yiddish in Israel and the place of Yiddish in Israeli culture, uh, you know, really corresponds to what we're doing. Other people might have found other fascinating aspects, but I think that one of the things that we are um, today from the vantage point of, of, of 2024, there are certain elements that we are so, we, we are kind of stuck with a very specific narrative uh, about, about Yiddish, about the death of Yiddish, so-called, right, during the Holocaust, and now Yiddish is a dead language, and it's kind of like ever-dying language, and the question of revival, that's just one example. <coughs> but also about the Holocaust itself, we have a kind of narrative that became cemented, right, over, over the year, uh, so what happened in the Holocaust, what does uh, post-Holocaust life means, what is the commemoration and the memory uh, uh, of the Holocaust, was it, what does it mean? And obviously also about Zionism, about what Zionism means, what Israel means, and the relationship between Israel and diaspora Jewry. So these are very large, very important, I would say, the most important topics for anyone who works in Jewish studies today. And I think that uh, 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 the beauty of Nick's uh, work and, and this lecture is that he touches uh, on, on, on all of these through this specific example of, uh, of Yiddish in, in Paris. So, of course, looking, looking at Yiddish in Paris for Nick is the, you know, he's the, he's the expert on this topic because of his work and his wonderful book, Yiddish Paris, Staging Nation and Community in Interwar uh, uh, France. And he noted, I'm just gonna try and do a little bit for you, kind of like recuperating, explaining what is I think, the argument that is uh, uh, um, evolving here is that during the interwar years in France, it was mostly the left, right? The communists, the Bundists, or the most kind of left-wing socialist Zionists who, um, who created who were the most active in the production of secular Yiddish culture by way of their institutions. And then after the war, some of it continues, but a lot of it kind of disappears a little bit. And then suddenly we see something that seems to us a little kind of counterintuitive or paradoxical that we see these Zionist organization and Zionist newspapers that are uh, uh, very active, but in Yiddish, right? So, I mean, obviously I think the main kind of question is continuity and break, right? In what sense there is a continuity to what happened before in the interwar period and even during the Holocaust period, and then what happens in the immediate uh, uh, years and, and, and after. But again, you know, I think it's also not just the question of the continuity of, and, and break within Paris and within kind of French Yiddish, but it's also something that really calls to our attention, even not just the narrative, but uh, terms. And I want to talk a little bit about terminology here, right? I mean, we say the Holocaust, right? But for the people themselves, these Yiddish speaking, they wouldn't use the word Holocaust. The word Holocaust in, in 45, 44, and even for many years after, simply did not exist. I mean, it was there as a word, but you know, it took a long time to have the word in, in English and be kind of became a universal word. Even the word Shoah in Hebrew, I mean, this is kind of the work that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing. There were so many debates about what should this thing that happened, you know, it took a long time to understand exactly what happened and the magnitude of that and, and, and the name. So, I mean, the, 
the Yiddish word, and again, it wasn't kind of universally accepted and happened very quickly, but the word that was used in, in Yiddish was Churben, Churben, right? Which has a very different meaning because it means the destruction, it goes back to Jewish memory of the first temple, second temple, many, many other uh, events in Jewish history, and it's a very different a, a term than using the word Holocaust, which is very problematic. We're not going to get into, into that. But it's not also, also that. It's also the word, words like Holocaust survivors, which again, today from this vantage point, we kind of, you know, we talk about survivors and we know kind of, or we think we know exactly who is survivor, what is survivor, what does survivor means. But for the people, especially in the period itself, there was no, I mean, there were so many different experiences. You mentioned, Nick, uh, how some people were in concentration camps in ghettos, some people escaped to the Soviet Union or to the other places and then found their way back. Uh, and, 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 you know, and, 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 and those of them who were not uh, 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 perished uh, in, the, in, the, in the Holocaust found their way back to Europe to displaced persons camps. So, and, and so the, the experience of these people was so different from each other and also the terms that they used for themselves, right? So displaced person, that's one term, right? That it's kind of more from the outside or from like the, U, the United Nations and the agencies. Um, but then again, in Yiddish, if we go back to Yiddish, the term that people use, which actually comes from Hebrew, a lot of these terms coming from the Bible, she'erita pleta, she'erisa pleta, it's, it's a very different kind of conception from our understanding of survival and kind of exactly, uh, uh, exactly what, what it means. So I think that part of the interesting work that Nick is doing here by looking at Yiddish materials is to see kind of what language and what kind of, uh, how people understand themselves, what kind of terms they mean. And I don't, want, I, I don't mean to be kind of like this kind of minute academic, detail on what terms, you understand what I mean? The terminology is really important because this is how people understand themselves and who they are and what they are doing. So here, you know, just you mentioned the, the, the name of the journal, Kiem or Kiem or Kiem, right? With how, how, how you translate it, you translate it into existence or into survival. Right, I mean, both translation are, are, are possible, but like, what does it mean that like to say Kiem, we exist, we are here and we are rebuilding a, a life, you know, which is also connected to resistance, right? Resistance is a big word, but what does resistance mean? Maybe we know, or we think we know more or less what it means uh, uh, to have resistance against the Nazis, but what does resistance mean? Is it only the ghetto uprising and the partisans and the whole question of heroism, all these, these questions, you know, that they, they, they might be familiar to some of you or not, you know, they have very, very different kind of political, ideological meaning within the context of the state of Israel, within American context, and then within European context and French context. So I wanted to, to bring it to, uh, um, you know, to our, to our attention. Uh, um, then when it comes, um, when it comes to the materials themselves, uh, the press is very important, right? And you talked a lot about these journals and these newspapers, and I think it's not an accident because although there's also theater, there's other spheres, uh, uh, the written world and the newspapers and the journals and, and publishing houses are, 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 very, um, are very important here. Uh, and, and, and I think here, uh, this is re really kind of like a comment or question for you, I think it's really interesting to kind of uh, compare and look at the press that was actually produced in the DP camps and people like Tamar Levinsky and other scholars have written about it to what was, uh, what was created in, because uh, some people I imagine came through uh, DP camps, some people maybe in, in other ways, but you know, already in the DP camps, we see something again that seems kind of counterintuitive that you see this whole political spectrum. And then there's also the debate about how many, let's say, call them survivors or, or Shaili Saplata, in the DP camps became Zionist. Many of them didn't, were not exposed to Zionism at all. They were not educated as Zionist. And then they became Zionist. But what does it mean for them to become Zionist? Was it a practical matter that they knew that after the DP camps, they don't want to go back to Poland, for example, for obvious reasons and 
other things that, that happen, but then they want to rebuild their life. And, and whether, you know, immigrating to Palestine or moving to America, to New York or to Paris, like where, where is it? So what kind of Zionism is it? That's, I think, a really interesting question. And that's also connected to the, the issue of immigration, the, the issue of immigration that we see, I think by mistake, so much as necessarily an ideological choice where very often it's a real practical matter. And there's a lot of contingency in it. I'm not gonna get into all the details, but I'm writing about it uh, uh, right now. Some of the most well-known and most famous kind of Yiddish writers, people like Avom Sutzkever and all that, you look at the time when he made the decision to immigrate to Tel Aviv and you realize how practical and almost co coincidental he could have been in, but his brother was there before. And so that's, that's kind of one element. And then the other element that I think is important is that this is not one way street. It's not that people immigrate and that's it. You know, they move from one place. And they, I mean, there are so many people, especially in this world that people are, are immigrating and you know, I have I have some 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 examples that are very relevant to you. Um, uh, someone like Mendelman, who moved, immigrated to uh, to Palestine, Israel. It's like 47, 48, just around the, the, the time of the war and the establishment of the state. And he was in Israel. He was very active in uh, the Israeli Yiddish uh, uh, literary and cultural scene. And then in 1961, he moved to Paris. And he worked as a journalist in Unser Wort, one of the newspapers that you, and this is so many people, whether they, um, you know, lived in one specific place for a number of years and then they moved to other places. Or I would argue even for people, let's again use the name Sutkave because he's the most well known. He lived in Tel Aviv and he didn't move to Paris or to New York. But he continued to travel all over the world. And really what he created, he saw himself as Okay, he's doing it in Tel Aviv, but he's really part of something that maybe some people call this Yiddish land, right? A, 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 this kind of transnational, global a, a Yiddish, a, a Yiddish culture. And I think this is part, definitely part of what is going on, and you, you alluded to it. So, I mean, I, I, I just want to say before I, before I end these, these remarks and leave you maybe with a few questions, uh, that, uh, you know, if, if we look at the situation in, in, uh, of what was created in Israel, there are kind of similar, similar phenomena that, that, that happens. I mean, there's so many new newspapers and journals that range all the way from Neivelt, the left-wing socialist Zionism, to Golden Arcade, which is supported by the Histadrut, right? So how... How more mainstream you can go, but what does it mean that it's supported by the Eastern Route and what is the ideological underpinning, right? But then there's also Lebensfragen, the newspaper of the Bundist. Now, here's a paradox for you. If you're a Bundist, you cannot be Zionist. It's a, it's a real contradiction, right? But the fact that there were so many, so many people who immigrated to Israel and they founded a newspaper called Lebensfragen. And Arbeter Ring, a, a, a cultural institution with a house that until a few years ago, you could go there to Kalisher Street and, and to uh, Brenner Street and, and you will have it there. It seems like a real contradiction, but for these people, it wasn't a contradiction, right? So that I think brings us a, 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 a lot of thoughts about what it means. And of course, there's the daily newspaper, Let's Deny Us by Tzanin. So there was a whole, and you can say one way to understand it is to say, okay, you know, you have all these immigrants who come into Israel, you have the whole uh, ideological and political spectrum, all the way from right wing to left wing and even communist and right. But I think there's another di dynamics that is happening here. And maybe that's the last thing that I'm going to say, and I'm going to leave you uh, uh, with it. So, you know, one of the questions that you ask, and you already, you already gave a beginning of, of an answer, is that really this is kind of Zionist, Zionist Yiddishist in Paris, but really what they are about is a, a kind of diaspora nationalism, right? That they, 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 they support Israel, they support the state of Israel, but they really more care about Jewish life in, in France, right? And I think there is, it's, 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 it's correct, but I think it also leads us to kind of ask what, you know, what do, what do we mean when we say Zionism? 
it's not one thing, right? There is the cultural Zionism of the of the uh, of the fin de siècle and early 20th century. The people, you know, really saw Zionism mostly as a cultural movement in the, the in the diaspora. Then there is territorial Zionism, and after 1948, there is a kind of statism of Ben Gurion. And you know, my last sentence would be that I think that the key to understand both Yiddish in Israel and Yiddish in, in Paris and in other places is that it, if for some people, for example, in Israel, Zionism and the whole es establishing Israeli culture meant the negation of exile, the negation of diaspora and the negation of Yiddish and East European Jewish culture say, okay, clean slate, this is new. Then everybody who, wrote in Yiddish was against it. And, you know, this was not for them uh, 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 a contradiction to, to Zionism or to being in Israel. And in that sense, there's some similar dynamics that is happening also in, in, in Paris. So maybe, maybe just, so I'll leave you with a, with, with a, with a, with a quick question for something that later, later on, I'm also wondering uh, whether after the period that you are talking about, there is something that we see happening in Israel and in America and in other places where there is not so much Yiddish that is created in Yiddish, but also the influence or the place of Yiddish in what is created by Jews in France, in, in, in French and maybe in other languages too. So in other words, kind of what uh, Jeffrey Chandler and other people spoke about as kind of post vernacular, where Yiddish becomes less of a language of communication, but retain this new a status of language of culture that people want to use for a, a creation in other languages. Leave it open to Nick to respond to whatever he wants and to Thank other you. people to uh, expand Thank on that. Or do you want to go there and I'll interrupt? Oh, we could, we could sit here, but I don't know about the camera. I'll, I'll try to. Yeah, I have a, great. Uh, so, Shahar, uh, I appreciate that response very much. It was it was uh, uh, lovely, and I'm really happy to hear that you think that some of my early attempts to answer some of these questions might be headed in the right direction. And you know, I think I think that you're the um, the kind of thinking about. Oh yeah, I think that thinking about. What's happening in post Corbin, uh, also the Yiddish, the, the Yiddish press in, in France sometimes used uh, a, a French cognate. They mm -hmm. used catastrophe, um, which is was kind of circulating among the French press too. So to, to your to your comment about the how people are describing um, the the events of the war, uh, that that vocabulary is still still being um, uh, um, um, developed. Um, so I think that very much um, this post-war period, I think, you know, my approach to it was my approach when I was working on the interwar years, which was that from a number of years, the historiography about Jews in France were that um, depending on which ideological camp you were in, were vehemently opposed to that particular group of Jews. And when I started doing my research, especially in Yiddish culture, I was like, that's true among party elites. That's not true among the people who are actually doing the cultural work to kind of create these community-based organizations, right? Whether it's an institution or a theater group or a cultural group. And so I'm taking a lot of that, like those, the assumption that people are people uh, and that sometimes our contacts dictate how it is that we kind of move forward in whatever type of project that we're doing. I'm bringing that to the post-war years, which I think very much there is not a contradiction within these um, French Yiddish-speaking Zionists. There's not a contradiction between maintaining Yiddish and maintaining Zionism. There's not a contradiction between maintaining Zionism and also trying to find a space wherever it is that you are in the world, right? I mean, I mentioned the name Israel Yefroikin, who was involved in the Yibo project in Paris in the late 19, uh, late 1920s um, and, um, and, and the 1930s, um, which in Paris especially had a very, very heavily 
um, articulated diaspora nationalist kind of um, outlook. So I do think that a lot of these people, because a number of them were in interwar France, were really kind of borrowing and pulling from those experiences because that is how they were able to move some of those cultural programs in the interwar years forward. And so they're just kind of relating that to their post-war experience. Uh, and how do, you, how do you build community? You need to kind of reach out to people where they are and develop things that you think that not, not only you want, but that you suspect that they will want in order to kind of maintain support for some of these initiatives. So I think very, you know, I think that it's, it's uh, I really appreciate you making that observation because that is the direction that I think a lot of this research is pointing me towards um, specifically for this particular moment. Yeah, yeah, so I appreciate that very much. We should stop taking because yeah. people might have yeah, to yeah. go and then oh, yeah, yeah. So if there are questions on or comments on in the room here, um, yes. Uh, thank you both very much. Um, in your talk, you mentioned journalism and literature and theater and music, but not film. So I wondered whether you had, had encountered any examples of film as a cultural expression in, in your research. So I, um, I, I haven't spoken very much about film because in either my first project or this project. And it's because I, I, I tend to look at the, cult, the productions that are happening in the space. So Yiddish film is being utilized and shown in Paris in the interwar and also in the post-war years, but they're not Parisian or French productions. Um, there is some use of Yiddish in a couple of films that are produced in the 1950s and the 1960s, but they're not full uh, language productions. Um, so I haven't worked on film um, primarily just because I have not found enough material that is emanating from that space that's kind of part of this whole world. Now, are these organizations hosting, you know, filmings of Unsere um, uh, uh, Kinder or Greener Feller? Yes, they are, um, but they're not producing their, their own. And so that's kind of one of the reasons I haven't really focused on film very much. I'd always wished and hoped that I would find something related to film, but I still have not. <laughs> By the way, that's, I think that's true also to, uh, to Israel in the, in the early years. You see a lot of uh, literary production, and theater, so there's resistance to it, and sometimes people try to but, uh, and people watch films, but these films are coming mostly from Poland and from New York and from other places. Yeah, I think maybe if there is this kind of Yiddish land sense, it's like people understand that certain, certain cultural productions are done, in, done really well in spe specific places and they see them say, okay, you know, I mean, we can bring it. Uh, we don't need to use it necessarily here. Yeah, so a couple questions. Uh, one is you kind of mentioned that um, there's a kind of lack of sources or a problem with sources. So I'm wondering if it's really that the Zionists were not producing things in the edition into our period or just that the sources aren't as around at the time. And then the other question, which is kind of related, is whether if there is more after the war, is it because there's different if it's all different people, if it's new people coming from Poland and things like that? So I have found some evidence of, of some uh, interwar Zionist Yiddish cultural production, but it tended more like Shachar mentioned, uh, like um, labor social, socialist Zionists, so tended to be towards the left. And they did work with the communists and the Bundes in um, developing events together. Um, I, but beyond some posters and some writings about some of the events, I haven't found, I still haven't found a lot. So I suspect that there was more than I even know of and wrote about. Um, but even then, the, the Zionist Yiddish culture that I know about tended to be a little bit more leftist, where what's happening in the post-war years is a little bit more centrist. Like the Arbeiterheim, the Linke Palazzion, still exists in post-war France. Uh, and they were the outfit that were producing in the post-war <coughs> years. In the post-war years, they get outpaced, from what I could tell so far, by the more centrist, the Federation Zionists. So that's a little bit of a, of a difference um, difference there. So I suspect that there was probably more, but I just haven't been able to, to find it, although I have found um, some. Uh, and then the other thing that I think is happening uh, during this period is that the, centra the centrist Zionists become much better at fundraising than anyone seemingly was doing during the interwar years and specifically fundraising, uh, getting loans from the JDC to help kind of some of these initiatives. So I think that 
they are able to tap into resources that the people in the interwarriors a didn't have available to them, and b uh, didn't if they were they didn't seem to be very successful in in fundraising uh, during the interwar years. It seemed that they went to domestic um, organizations, domestic organizations in France for fundraising, primarily the Alliance Israeli uh, Universelle. Um, and some others as well. They didn't tend to look outside of the boundaries of France. In the post-war years, people like Yefroik and Mark Yarblum, who are highly integrated in the JDC, are utilizing some external funding to help some fund some of these initiatives too. So I guess no. Um, oh yeah, there are some uh, questions here. Uh, no, there are just comments. The, the, some of your questions have been. Some of the questions were answered in your discussion, and then uh, and then a comment that uh, appreciate. So Do you I, want Nick maybe to to respond to the question of uh, the place of the place of Yiddish in 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 French writing and materials by in later years, or is that something that you? Might look at it later. Uh, so I am. I still have planned to look at it later, but I have already started looking at some resources. Um, so it's a very similar thing that happens in New York to, to Yiddish in, in France, and it becomes very much a marker of a cultural community. It is no longer needed for uh, everyday communication. So there is a move in the 50s, but really in the 60s and the 70s, to kind of utilizing Yiddish uh, as kind of a cultural marker, and that it's all and it's done um, to kind of represent a past, not necessarily like a lived necessity of that particular moment. So to some extent, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the use of Yiddish on a regular basis declines from the late 1940s into uh, the 1970s. To, and to some extent, it's a similar story that's happened uh, in other places as well. I should say this, though, too, um, you know, we we sometimes mark the, the post-war years as the beginning of that slope, not just because of of the Chorben, but uh, for other reasons too. But in Paris, the, uh, I mentioned the communist leftist newspaper, the Naya Pressa. In 1936 and 1937, they actually do a French language column in the Yiddish communist press that's for children. Mm -hmm. So even in the 1930s, they know that younger people are not speaking Yiddish as much as they were. Um, so this is, at least in, in France, and I'm sure similar cases around the world, that the kind of the decline in, in, in kind of regular use of Yiddish as a day-to-day -day language begins really in the 1930s. Um, uh, like I said, through like, through the use of French in the some of the Yiddish press. And one of the previous fellows uh, studied it in uh, Argentina, and that's the same the same process that's happening. Oh, also, the NYPL. So, I think we will continue um, maybe over the food. Thank you so much for uh, for the wonderful talking conversation, and I hope everybody else will join us tomorrow at six p.m. for the last part of the. Um, how did we get here? A deep dive into the history of Palestine on uh, Israel and Palestine on um, the October 7th and the aftermath. And that's uh, in um, the McNally Amphitheater. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to more. Thank yeah. you.